When it came to curing the ill before 1906, most of the healthcare industry relied on the fact that 80% of all illnesses were self-limiting. Even legitimate drug companies were more concerned with the purity of their product than the pharmacology of it, a science that was still in its infancy. However, in that gilded age of robber barons, oil moguls, railroad tycoons, there were a few who understood the intense marketability for alcohol, morphine, cocaine, or a placebo. These were the patent medicine makers, unwatched and unregulated entrepreneurs who offered to cure the incurable for a dollar a bottle and whose research and development department rarely consisted of anything more than an advertising office. Advertising requires quick recognition for its maximum effect. And at the close of the 19th century, there were few quicker images equating to health than the small Midwestern city of Battle Creek, Michigan. Now known as the nation's cereal city, there was a time when its reputation for breakfast foods was eclipsed by its fame as the location for the Battle Creek Sanitarium and its cure through biological living, namely a regimen of exercise, fresh air, and a vegetarian diet. Both the cereal industry and the sanitarium were the products of the brothers Kellogg, and the development of breakfast foods was largely the work of the elder brother and sanitarium chief of staff, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, who approached diet and nutrition as a means to cure any malady. Dear friends, I thought as I had a leisure moment I'd write you a few lines. Lucy's feeling better, but she's still very weak from her sick spell. It's been very hard for her to take her treatments. One treatment she likes, it's to be put into a great coffin-like box filled with water connected with a battery. From there, she's laid out on a long, narrow bed, wiped, rubbed, slapped, and oiled with coconut oil. She's had two like this every day. It costs Lucy $11 for board and treatments a week and five for my board and, well, we have one of the poorest rooms. Dr. Kellogg lectures in the parlors on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Yesterday his lecture was on Qatar of the nose. Lucy likes the Swedish movements, though. They give her a good shaking. Glad to hear from home. Think we'll know how to appreciate it when we go back. Sincerely, Aunt Mary. In fact, C.W. Post, a long-term patient at the sanitarium and eventual founder of Post Cereals, gained much of his company's product line by copying the output of the Kellogg brothers, making millions in the process and opening the floodgates for other cereal enterprises. Aspiring millionaires soon recognized the road to Wellville as a fast path to wealth and set up shop or at least hung out their shingles in Battle Creek. Post himself was not above making medical claims for his food products. Postum, his grain coffee beverage, could make blood red, cure coffee neuralgia, coffee heart, or prevent the blindness possible through coffee drinking. Not bad for a combination of bran and molasses. His grape nuts was a blood purifier, and in 1898, he promoted it as a specific for appendicitis, tuberculosis, and malaria. Of course, it worked better when consumed with a certain amount of faith. If mere cereal could do this, imagine what an actual drug could accomplish. For example, the Brooks Drug Company claimed its burdock tonic was good for rheumatism, catarrh, kidney disease, stomach troubles, liver complaints, malaria, constipation, and skin disorders for only a dollar. Its slogan of blue-blooded people's blood 
made a bright blood red, must have been difficult for the users of the product at about 20 proof. But what of this ubiquitous catarrh? Originally, Hippocrates defined the term as an inflammation of the mucous membranes, especially of the head and throat. But by the late 1800s, the term had grown to encompass almost any disease imaginable. For example, appendicitis was not appendicitis. It was catarrh of the appendix. Ulcers became catarrh of the stomach. A canker sore was not a canker sore. It was catarrh of the lip. And a contemporary observer wrote that using this definition, malaria could become catarrh of the mosquito that bit you. So by trying to mean everything, catarrh eventually meant nothing. Some were content to use Battle Creek only as a mailing address. The old Indian Medicine Company of Battle Creek and Toledo never appeared in any city directory, but this maker of Wahoo Bitters offered local residents a special introductory rate of 25 cents per bottle with a three bottle limit. Its only listed ingredient was alcohol, 6.1%. As for CMC of Battle Creek, whose lung balsam, a supposed cure for tuberculosis, was 9% alcohol, it is doubtful that its board of directors ever set foot in the cereal city. However, a select few did come to Battle Creek. Truesdale Gorham stayed for eight years and offered to treat your asthma by mail, although we're not exactly sure how, using this train station as his office address. It's now a restaurant. Miss Jane's Suburban Laboratories created cosmetics from rose petals that would not perspire off, reproducing that natural tint of perfection. Her cream of roses removed wrinkles, freckles, and took care of that so embarrassing tan. Oh, by the way, you won't find a structure at the advertised addresses of Miss Jane's Suburban Laboratories. That's one of the problems with doing research in Battle Creek. Dr. Kellogg's home, his 20-room mansion, is gone, and one of his sanitarium buildings was converted to a historic parking lot in the mid-1980s. W.K. Kellogg, his home, fared somewhat better, although it was moved to beneath the protective shadow of the foundation he created. But I digress. Interest in homeopathic medicine and the success of Humphrey's cures resulted in Ensign's remedies appearing in 1904. Winfield Ensign, a printer in neighboring Union City, moved to Battle Creek, set up his print shop, and distributed his biochemic preparations and tissue foods for one dollar a vial. The advertisements for these remedies promise treatments for just about anything. Bashful? Take Remedy 186A. Delusions? If they're animals, take 187A and B. If people, take 187E and F. Despair of your soul's salvation? Take 188E and F. Ensign's claim was that whatever is sufficient to build a human body is sufficient to keep it in repair, that these were composed of foodstuffs and essential material which will be used if needed and thrown off as waste if not. Even in an election year, that's a pretty safe statement to make. His print shop also generated advertisements claiming that these remedies are to be relied upon in the most dangerous of ailments. Dr. Edward R. Jeb left his practice in nearby Climax to join the Materia Medica of Battle Creek, bringing with him the liquid therapies he had been compounding at his farm laboratories. With his remedies for rheumatism, eczema, hemorrhoids, and again, the ubiquitous catarrh, he attracted investors and advertised a working capital of $300,000. In reality, it was 50,000, but still a substantial sum at the turn of the century. His consultations were free, and his cures were 10% alcohol. What it has done for others, it will do for you, was Dr. Jeb's slogan. Nor were businessmen blind to the advantage of using a familiar name. The Kellogg Blood and Food Company had no connection with the cereal manufacturers and was the brainchild of a local pharmacist and his tailor. The Kellogg here was an employee of an advertising agency who only served as secretary in a company that promised medicine of unusual curative and healing properties. 
there's no record of anything being produced except an investment pool of $5,000. Frank J. Kellogg, or Professor Kellogg, as his advertising read, took a far more active role in his company. The Kellogg Safe Fat Reducer, Sanitone Wafers, Malto Fructo, Rango, and Protone all floated through the mails from his various mobile offices between Detroit and Battle Creek. Originally a traveling toiletry salesman, he worked for a year at the Kellogg Cereal Company before embarking on his illustrious career of helping obese Americans turn fat into muscle. His business success was so complete and his stature so secured that he was able to head Battle Creek's City Bank and take up residence at a fashionable Maple Street address. Although he did make sure to list his home as a less pretentious structure on Green Street. His marketing technique consisted of aggressive mailings of unsolicited samples for which he would then demand payment. Those who actually sent in money found themselves on his permanent mailing list, receiving perpetual shipments of this food that turns fat into muscle. If Rango worked too well, you could then switch to Protone, his patented flesh builder. But perhaps the most colorful pairing of business associates were doctors James Peebles and W. Thompson Bobo. Peebles came to Battle Creek after a career that included crusades for women's suffrage, the abolition of slavery, and vegetarian diets. He had written books against vaccination and claimed, through his psychic gifts, to have unlocked the secrets of everlasting life. With the rallying cry that Calvinism causes biliousness, he launched a new career with his Peebles Institute of Health, promising a brain restorative for epilepsy and all diseases of the brain and nervous system by mail. Dr. Bobo was his general manager, and he promoted the clinic with the same zeal he took to his favorite sport, golf. Their health institute was conveniently located on the third floor above Minty's Cigar Store in Battle Creek. With cereal, the sanitarium, and the business of health brewing like a tank of piranha in such a small area, it is remarkable how any disease could have had a fighting chance in Battle Creek. But other eyes were watching. A series of articles appearing in Collier's Magazine in 1905, written by Samuel Hopkins Adams, exposed the patent medicine industry as the great American fraud. At the same time, a ladies' home journal expose used the research of Dr. A.J. Reed of the Battle Creek's own sanitarium to determine the alcohol content of patent medicines and compare it to the standard saloon fare. Lager beer came in a distant fourth. These reports widely reprinted and circulated, helped pass the first Food and Drug Act the following year. While considered groundbreaking, it only required that the ingredients appear on the bottle. As a result, the effects of this new law were hardly immediate in the cereal city. Jeb remedies were the first to falter, although not by any legislative action. Business was already slacking off when Dr. Jeb suffered a fatal fall at his home on October 3rd, 1907. However, his treatments were still distributed unchanged from his home by family members until 1908. In 1913, the Enzyme Company was taken to task, not by a federal agency, but by the Michigan State Dairy and Food Commissioner. Analysis showed that the essential foodstuffs in Enzyme remedies were 100% sugar at about $59 a pound. The Ensign Company countered by publishing The Truth Teller, a magazine describing the victimization of homeopathic medicine by standard therapists. The remedies were still available as late as 1940, at which point the company chose to concentrate on its printing business. Frank J. Kellogg came under the scrutiny of the AMA in 1912, when it was revealed that his anti-fat formula was a potentially dangerous combination of thyroid extracts and laxatives. Undaunted, he dropped the thyroid, changed the name, and produced casca beans as a laxative. He became more well-known by this time for a spectacular divorce case, his fifth, 
which was annulled by the Michigan Supreme Court. The court found both parties guilty and decided that they deserved each other. He died shortly afterwards, yet his casca bean continued to be sold until 1940. Professor Kellogg's fashionable Maple Street address is now a bed and breakfast. Pretty good one, I hear. Although I don't think you're going to see Rango on the menu. Professor Kellogg's legacy does not stop there. In the 1930s, a new product appeared briefly as part of the Battle Creek treatment. Bon Cora offered to streamline the bulky silhouette with its own unique blend of acacia and cascara shedding pounds with a drug-induced bulimia. The naked lady on the bottle didn't hurt sales either. Dr. Peebles, dressed like King Lear in a Brooks Brothers suit, was brought before Detroit's U.S. District Court on June 1, 1912 on charges of fraud. His brain restorative was found to be a preparation of alcohol flavored with bitter almonds, the polite description for cyanide. Although in his late 80s, he brought with him a youthful traveling companion, proof he felt of his divine healing powers. In spite of the assorted courtroom theatrics, he was found guilty of the charges and fined. Five dollars. He and his companion then moved to Los Angeles, where the good doctor blamed the world's conflicts on evil spirits, and eventually died, just one month short of his 100th birthday. When a seance was held on his centennial, his alleged spirit was asked how he was able to live so long. It replied, I behaved myself. Back on planet Earth, it was left for Dr. Bobo to pay the $5 fine and keep the clinic going. He eliminated the troublesome treatment for epilepsy and instead began a promotion for his non-surgical cure for goiter. His campaign was successful enough to occupy over two dozen assistants. When he began his publicity for a mail-order diabetes cure, however, both he and his clinic came under federal investigation. On a cold January morning in 1934, after a sleepless two weeks, Dr. Bobo took his own life with a 32 caliber revolver. His obituaries didn't mention any of his business dealings, but focus instead on what he considered to be his finest achievement, the layout and design of Battle Creek's first 18-hole golf course. At the time of his death, his wife was in Florida visiting their orange groves and attending a Christian science seminar. His clinic, renamed the Battle Creek Appliance Company, folded a year later following further threats of investigations from Washington. By World War II, the only cures coming from the cereal city were sugar frosted. But Battle Creek continued to make cereal, and if it lost some of its colorful notoriety, it's Dr. Kellogg or even the nation's first established sanitarium in the process, it could find comfort in the fact that the average American consumes 10 pounds of breakfast cereal every year, and that most of that cereal comes from this small Midwestern town. Somehow, when they stop that rhythm, I've got to hurry up and do it. 